Hi everyone and welcome to the Photoshop show. This is going to be a good show. They all are, but this one especially because tonight we are keeping somebody up all night who's going to regale us with his knowledge of Photoshop. And that is our special guest, the guy down there at the bottom wearing the headphones. That's Pierre Etienne Couture. Did I butcher wow, it? Yes. No, 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 no. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. And I also want to welcome our wonderful panelists, Mr. Dave Bell. You can wave to the folks. Good Dave. evening, everyone. <laughs> and Ms. Karen Hutton. And my co host, Ron Clifford. Hello. So, as always, when we get started with the Photoshop show, I like to give everyone a chance to say hi to you and tell you what they're doing these days because each one of these people has an amazing life, both online and offline. So, I want to know what they're doing. And we can start right there next to me with Mr. Dave Bell. Well, um, good evening, everyone. It is always a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I am actually a college professor teaching information systems courses, but I, sl but I run around with my camera everywhere I can and uh, just enjoy this community on Google Plus and have learned so much um, just interacting with the people here and plan to spend as much time as I can here. Great. And so are you at liberty to say where you teach or is that? Yes. Um, I am in the north end of the Napa Valley, a little private college called Pacific Union College. Um, put in Newsweek uh, in the fall as the most beautiful college in America. Wow. So, good wow. place to be. That's really cool. Well, Karen, do you know, you must know that area because you're also from California. I right? do. I do. I, I Dave, I was long gone before Dave ever graced the area, but it is really beautiful and he's right. What he said is absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> so, Karen, what are you doing these days? Well, I am uh, well, I'm Karen Hutton and uh, my website is uh, karenhuttonphotography.com. Let's see, what am I doing? I just had an ebook come out last uh, month called I slash, or as I'm given to understand, Pipe. Great line. We at flatbooks.com. It's a book of stories, little stories and photographs. And uh, I'm getting ready to go to New Zealand. And I'm very, 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 very excited. Well, that's really exciting. I don't. I think that got muted. Somebody was moving around. You're going well, to New Zealand, right? I'm going to New Zealand. Yes, I'm going to New Zealand to, uh, you know, hang out with Trey Ratcliffe and gang for his workshop. I'm there to assist or help or laugh at all the right places, whatever the case may be. And um, I leave in about a week and a half, and I'm really excited. <laughs> So is that workshop full, or can people still? It join? is full. It is full. People can find out more at. Um, I actually have a link. I don't have the, the chat up, but um, it's a, you can find out more at Stuck in Customs on uh, in the New York. What, what, not New York. New Zealand Photo Adventure is what he's calling it, and um, I have my little picture there and everything. It's going to be really, really fun. He's he's breaking new ground with these workshops, so it's exciting to you know be a part of it. <laughs> yes, it really is. It's, yeah. it's a great thing. It's so yeah. cool. I'm very happy for you. I'm totally jealous. You have to Sorry. tell him I'm coming next time, no matter what. I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that'll be great. Yeah. And again, that's stuckincustoms.com. So you guys yes. go over there and check it out. Okay, so next to Karen, we have our special guest, Pierre Etienne. Can you please tell us something about you and where you live and what you've been up to all these years? Okay, so I'm from Belgium, so the other side of the planet, almost. Uh, I really wish I could go. Uh, do you need uh, anyone to carry your luggage to uh, New Zealand, Karen? Uh, you know, I kind of do. I'm actually taking way too many bags because I'm bringing extra things over, and, and I need, a, you know, a handmaiden, and you're more than welcome to audition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm a photographer, videographer uh, for a big uh, international organization it's all over the place, all over the world. I'm also a Photoshop addict. I need to uh, say it to all the entire world. I am. Uh, I started. I discovered Photoshop many years ago and was immediately hooked to hooked to it. I started to gather all the info I could back in the time when I had no internet connection, so it was mostly books, magazines, and so on. And I remember we were passing each other floppy disk with the Kaipor tips, for those that remember. It's a good thing to search K-A-I 
power tips, the search it on Google, you will find a lot of cool, uh, old school information on how to do stuff in Photoshop without layers. So that's that's how old it was. And then uh, I finally had my own internet connection and then started to search for information. I joined several forums, started to ask questions, and then when I gained enough knowledge, I started to answer some questions when I could. And I became moderator on PhotoshopTechniques.com and some other places, Photoshop Google's. I was moderator uh, many places. I like to moderate. Maybe Belgian are very moderate people. That's why we've got good beer and waffles and chocolate. Uh, but uh, then I started also to go to the official Adobe forums because that's where Jeff Shuey, back then the, the, the late uh, Bruce Fraser was there. He was really a great, great guru. And they were all sharing all insider information, a lot of tips and so on. So I stuck up to it over there. And uh, with the years passing by, I started to uh, gather some information. So I, st I helped... Um, Ian Lyons, we, who is uh, a Photoshop and uh, Lightroom guru, to build up the uh, FAQs for uh, Camera Raw, the Frequently Asked Questions. And uh, then, with the time passing by, I became moderator as well in the uh, official Adobe forums, in the Adobe Community Help. I will talk about that later. So, uh, and then finally was uh, recently inducted in the uh, Photoshop, uh, Adobe Community Professionals, which is a, a big title, but in fact it gives us some background information about all the questions that the customer asks. And uh, so we are asked to be active on Twitter, Google Plus, and so on to try to help as many people as we can. Hence me being here. Thank you, Ian and uh, Ron, for the invitation. That's really an amazing resume. I mean, I am I am <laughs> bored by that. If for those of you who don't know out there, the people that he mentioned are the gods of Photoshop. You know, uh, Jeff Shuey and Bruce Fraser, the late Bruce Fraser and Ian Lyons, and you. Uh, and <laughs> really, uh, it's an honor to have you here. And I'm I'm really scared about doing a tutorial in front of you because no, you know, no, no, no. you're the guy. Yeah, but that's really great. And you know, I. Um, you were reminding me before the show that we met a long time ago um, when I used to run this thing called the unofficial um, Photoshop weblog. Yeah. Remember that? And it was Jason Calacanis' first, uh, what did he call it, like a web network where he mm. had a whole bunch of different websites, the unofficial Apple weblog, the Photoshop one, and Gadget was one of them. Yes. Um, and all, you know, some that really took off. And I'd forgotten that. I'd, the other place that Pierre and I ran into each other was on the very secretive um, we, we do a little bit of testing for Adobe before the products come out to the world. And I've seen him posting there for a really long time. Always write on posts. Perfectly, you know, great. Always the stuff I'm interested in. Thank you, but, uh, I can return you the compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's great. So pretty soon, um, Pierre is going to talk to us about what to do when Photoshop is acting naughty and it isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing and how you can fix things in all those different cases. Right, Pierre? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> And then finally, we have down there Ron Clifford, my wonderful co-host. And Ron works so hard on this show, on Google Plus in general, on the Photoshop and Lightroom community that we started on Google Plus, and as a photo mentor, all kinds of things. What are you doing this week, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> doing all kinds. I'm trying to stay warm. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Boy, it's cold up here. Man, is it that cold where you are, Jim? Oh, my God. It's 65 degrees. It's going to be even more tomorrow. In the middle of winter in Colorado. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. It's about. Uh, it's going down to about 28 below Celsius here. I'm not sure what that is Fahrenheit. What is but that? It'll Cold. Stick your nose together. It'll freeze your pipes. Yikes! That's scary. Yeah. It's really cold. Yeah, and, it, and we're actually a warmer part of the the province. There, it's it's in Manitoba. It's 40 below, and up north from here, it's 40 below. Whoa. So but aren't you going somewhere? I thought you were going to go to Haiti or yeah, something. Yeah, I'm going to Haiti on February 18th. And so that's going to be a real shock, <laughs> for sure. Yes, it will. And what are you doing there? We're doing some humanitarian work uh, at a place that's building children's homes in a small um, uh, kind of compound village community. And so we're helping out an organization called Joy and Hope. And um, what they, I guess the the... The long-term goal is to raise a lot of the orphan kids from the earthquake because there's still a very serious 
uh, problem there. And not just to raise them in a large institutional orphanage, but actually give them more of homes. And so there will be eight or nine kids per home. And, um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to help build the homes. We're actually, the crew we're going down with, I think we're doing some road construction. So it's going to be some hard work on hot days. Wow. Oh, that's really admirable. That's great. I'm glad to hear you doing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I'm working on that uh, we just got underway is um, we're in the second week of the advanced mentorship program for photographers. I'm running a, a special advanced mentorship program to carry on from the, the ones that I had previously run. So there's a, a select group of people that were previously enrolled in my mentorship that we're going through a more advanced version of that. And we're just having a great time. And Google Communities is working amazingly in that regard because we're able to have this small group of people in a private setting where we can have great sharing, different categories. The communities, that's one of the areas where they just really shine. Yeah, I've been thinking that, that communities are re- would really be good for classes if you're teaching, for example, Dave Bell, maybe you can have a community for just a class you're teaching. Um, and it's, you know how easy it is to have hangouts and post things. Yeah, I plan on using it next quarter. Yeah, yeah. That's great. great. And it's also good for companies, like if you're having private meetings. I keep trying to do Skype with people and then we give up and just turn on Google Plus and do a hangout. <laughs> you know. Or you could have a little community of the people in your workplace. It's great. Yeah, it really is. It is. So, and you know, um, like like a fool, the second day of communities, I hopped on there and made the Photoshop and Lightroom community, and um, we did it. I did it in a, in a different way. I didn't make it real pub. I made it public, but public in a way that's moderated, and that means that all the people who have been kind enough to join me in moderating that group, including Ron, have to spend lots of time looking through, uh, you know, applicants to who want to join the group. Um, and it is a big undertaking, and I just wanted to thank you publicly, Ron, for doing that, and everybody else, uh, David Marks and um, Ali Al uh, Hajj, John. John Lorenz, David Marks. Uh, David Marks is great. He's really helping out. So all those people, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, now let's get down to business. Um, so I have to say in advance that uh, this morning, because of the time difference between here and Belgium, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get in contact with Pierre. And so Ron and I were making all kinds of little backup plans. And um, <laughs> I put together a little tutorial this morning, and then I had to go off to work. Um, so um, the tutorial I put together, I, I did it so that it could you know, take up a bunch of time if Pierre didn't show up. <laughs> so here's what you have to do, Ron. You have to cut me off after 10 minutes, okay? okay? No matter what I'm doing, because I could, you know, this could Stop go. Stop watches on. You've got 10 minutes. All right, go. I got 10 minutes. So I'm going to share my screen, if I can find the thing. They keep moving it. Here's the screen share button. So you should now see Photoshop CS6 with a photo open. Do you see that? Yeah, mm-hmm. we got it fine. Terrific. So, um, this is Photoshop CS6, but I went into my preferences before the show under Photoshop Preferences Interface, and I changed the way that the interface looks. Because by default, now with Photoshop CS6, everything looks nice and dark, and that helps to focus on the photos. But I was finding that with this image, I couldn't see the dark frame around it against the dark document window. So I chose a different color theme here. And that's something that you can do, you know, come in here whenever you need to and change that out in case you didn't know about that. So what I wanted to show you how to do is um, to build something like this, where you start with a photograph and you build it out into, in this case, a mat and a frame. And there's a special word for this kind of image that maybe you've been noticing online if you've been reading lately um, about uh, design blogs. They're all talking about this, what are they called? Skuomorphic. Skuomorphic. Do you ever hear that word? Mm-mm. Well, I think what it means is a skeuomorphic um, item is something online that is designed to simulate something real. So in this case, it would be you know trying to make this look like a real frame and a real mat around this image. And other examples are uh, like um, for the Apple uh, address book. If you look at your Apple address book, you'll find it has little staples in the middle, and it kind of is made to look like real pages. Those Mm -hmm. are all other examples. And, you know, people are saying, oh, that's not cool anymore. That was good at the beginning of the Internet when people needed to make, you know, metaphors to real-life things in order to understand what was happening. Now it just gets in the way. However, I think it looks cool. 
So I want to show you how to do this. And I have an ulterior motive here, not so much you know, that it's important to know how to design a mat and a frame, but there are lots of little shortcuts using the crop tool, um, using layer styles, and lots of other practical things that you can use as you, do, um, as you build out photos into larger designs in Photoshop. So this is where we're going. Let's go and start with just this, a photo. This is a photo that I took, who knows where, where do you think? Where do I take all my photos? In Paris. I took it in Paris. Paris. Just as I unclicked my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, some kind of puppet store, and I just thought it was so cute. So I took this little picture. Well, let's say that I want to add um, a big white mat around this to start the process of building out my mat and frame. First thing to do is to take a look at the layers panel. And this happens to be just a regular old layer. but this might be a background layer. You guys know how when you uh, open a photo to start with, it often says background in the layers mm -hmm. panel? Mm -hmm. Let me show you that. I'm going to make this into a background layer so you know what I mean. So this is the way a lot of photos open. And if you have a background layer, you can't put layers beneath it in the layers panel. So one of the little tips that I you know, show people all the time, some people are surprised, is that you can make this into a regular layer by just clicking on the lock on this layer and dragging it down to the trash icon at the bottom of the layers panel. And now it's a regular layer, and I can treat it like I would any content layer. I'm going to give this one a name. I'll call it Photo. I'm a real stickler about naming my layers, too. Okay, next thing. I want to uh, add this white mat, mat around this image. Now, what, what would you do, Ron? Are you sleeping over there? Are you, I don't know if you're paying attention, but if you are, uh, what would you do to add space around this image? I, I can't say immediately because I was chatting, and I missed what you were saying. I knew you were. Yeah, I was, I was, I was keeping, keeping engaged in the chat, sorry. <laughs> well, I think if I had asked most people, uh, they would probably say they would go up to the image menu and well, go down to yeah, canvas, canvas size. Canvas size yeah. But the truth is, I don't like to do that because I can't do math in my head. And canvas size requires you to do math. We'll look at it in a moment. So I like to do everything as quickly and as visually as I can in Photoshop. So here's a trick you may not know for increasing canvas size. And that is to get the crop tool in the toolbar. And then with the crop tool, I'm going, to cl I'm going to move into the image. And in Photoshop CS6, you automatically get this bounding box around the image. I'm going to hold down two modifier keys, the shift key to constrain proportions, and the option key so that I can make the canvas bigger from the center out. And then if I click on any of the corner anchor points and drag, you can see the, bounding, the crop bounding box getting bigger. And then so I'll release cool. my modifier keys. You've got to do that first. I lied. I will release my mouse and then I'll release my modifier keys. Now, did you see that when I did it in the wrong order, it got messed up? Yep. So that's kind of an icky little thing. I call those gotchas. <laughs> Were you going to say something, Karen? No, I was just saying that's really cool. I didn't know this trick. It's, it's, I love it because I'm always doing the canvas size thing. Yeah. Well, I know There's, you're really visual, so that would be good for you. Yeah. I, I know we all, we all do things in ways and we see someone else do it like, oh, Wait, of course. You know, yeah. Uh, that's great. Love it. Thank you. Well, then, like with every crop, I have to accept the crop by going up to the options bar for the crop tool, and there's a little check mark there. So I'll check that, and that gets rid of that overlay. So now take a look at the layers panel, and you'll see that we have our photo inside of a bunch of transparent pixels represented by the gray and white. What I'd like to do now is add a white layer beneath this one so it will show through where there are transparent pixels, and that'll simulate the mat in our mat and frame. Now, you may not know this either, but if you want to add a new layer beneath a layer, you'll hold down the Command key on the Mac, that's the Control key on the PC, and with the layer beneath which you want your new layer, you'll go down and click the um, Add New Layer button. But it's holding that command key, the control key on the PC, that puts the new layer beneath the selected one, as opposed to the normal, beha normal behavior where the new layer comes in above whatever layer is selected. Make sense? Yep. All right, I'm going to call this my mat layer. And the mat layer currently has nothing on it. There it is. I'm going to fill that mat layer with white. Another little trick. If you look over on the left in my toolbar, you can see that I have red and blue as my background and foreground colors, respectively, in the bottom of the toolbar. But I'd rather have these be black and white for this exercise. And if you press the D key on your keyboard, D is in dog, or dummy, or Dave. <laughs> Dave <laughs> dummy and Dave, okay. Yeah, nice. Or nice default. There, Jan. 
<laughs> you get you get you get black as your foreground color and white as your background color. So that's what I chime in. I love mnemonics. D is for default. That, those are the default colors. Oh, I knew there was a reason. Thank you. That makes sense. Well, now I want to fill with white. And rather than go up to the fill dialog box and you know go through all that mess, I'd like to use shortcuts for filling. And to fill with the, whatever color is in the background color box, like in this case white, I'm going to hold down the command key and press the delete key. On a PC, that's hold down the control key and press the backspace key. So command delete on a Mac fills that layer with white. Who so knew? That's yeah. genius. Well, I wouldn't say that, but it's it useful. Is. Well, <laughs> it is genius. I love it. It That's is. Great. Do you know? Do you know who's a master of shortcuts? Jason. We had him on the last show. Jason. Jason Joseph. He's Jason a Joseph. Of shortcuts. He's got a shortcut for everything. He's the shortcut king. He's just the king. Period. Well, I have a I have a real spiel about shortcuts, which is I'm usually most of the people who take classes are not experts. They're more beginners or maybe early intermediate users. And the fact is, they're having enough trouble without trying to remember every shortcut. So. I tell people, look, I'm only going to tell you the really useful ones. I'm not just telling you shortcuts so I look cool. These are ones you might actually use, I would hope. So take it with that grain of salt. And you still come out looking cool. It's just awesome the way cool. that works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So anyway, I'm going to turn off the photo layer. There is the matte layer filled with white. Turn that back on. Okay. Now we're going to do something even cooler. I want to add um, a little black border around all of this that will become my black frame. If I were to um, use that crop trick I just showed you, that border would not be even on the top, bottom, right, and left. For example, if you look at this white mat, notice that it's thinner on the top than it is on the sides. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So that just has to do with the uh, proportions of the original image. So in this case, I want my frame to be exactly the same width all the way around. So that's when I need to go up to the image menu and go to canvas size. Now, Pierre, you may have something to say about that. I just made that up. I figured that out on my own. I may be wrong, but that's what seems right to me. What do you no, think? No, it is totally right. I would do that, or I've got another idea for the same stuff. It's to okay. use the uh, uh, FX button. You see the layer style. But yeah. I think you will use layer styles anyways for the, the finishing part. I am, I am. But first I want to get it all set up, but you're exactly yes. right. So now I'm going to go up to the image menu and I'm going to come down to canvas size. And here in the canvas size dialog box, big important thing is to check relative. And that means whatever numbers I add into the width and height fields are just going to be added to the current dimensions of the image. But if I did check relative, then whatever numbers I put here will be the total dimensions. Make sense? And we don't want that. I just want relative. And then I'm going to put in some number of pixels of width and height. And notice that I have this menu set to pixels. I think by default it's inches. So you want to be sure if it is in inches, put it in pixels. Now, how do you figure out how many pixels? Well, what I do is I look up here and I see the current size in pixels, 728 pixels wide, 562 tall. And then I can kind of say in my mind, well, that means I don't want 300 for the border, right? It's going to be too fat relative to the rest of this. I don't know, I'll pick enough. Maybe I'll try 40 pixels for my frame all the way around, 40 on each side. Now, let's say that might be too fast. Let's do 20 on each side. That's a nice, easy number. So in order to get 20 pixels a frame on each side, I do have to do a little math. I have to type 40 pixels in the width field and 40 pixels in the height field. Do you know why? Mm -mm. All right, so this is easy math. And you know what? It's amazing how hard it is to do even easy math in your head. If you got a width of 40 pixels, there's two sides to this thing. So that's going to give you 20 on each side. And if you have a height of 40 pixels that you're adding, you know, 20 of them are going to go on the top and 20 on the bottom. Of course. Okay. So then we go and make sure the anchor point for all of this is set in the center, which is the default, and we click OK. And I think this dialog box is way more complicated than it should be for most people. You know, they look at this diagram, and if they go like this, they have no idea what's going to happen. Millions of arrows going off in every direction. So that's the kind of thing, reason I don't like to come in here. But I'm going to click OK. Now, we have more transparent pixels around the edge of the white frame, or the white mat, and they're all even. we got 20 on each of the four sides. So that's good. Well, now I'm going to make yet another new layer 
and I'm going to fill that new layer with black, and that will peek through in this transparent area. So again, I'll go over to the Layers panel, I'll do the same thing I did last time. Hold down the Command key, the Control key on the PC, and click the New Layer button. And I get a new layer at the bottom of the layer stack, which I'll call Frame. Now, another trick. I want to fill the frame with whatever color is here in the foreground color box. That's black this time. So it's a different shortcut than filling with the background color. To fill with the foreground color, which I actually do more often, it's Option Delete on the Mac or Alt Backspace on the PC. So Option Delete fills with the foreground color. And, you know, turn these off and you can see the whole frame layer is black. All right, now comes the fun part that Pierre was talking about, which is, Pierre, what did you mention? Mute. Layer adding styles. layer styles. Adding layer styles. And the reason I'm going to do that is to make, one, is to make this look more realistic, because right now it just looks flat. So if we want to go to that skeuomorphic style that, you know, is now considered not cool, <laughs> this is what you would do. With the frame layer selected, I'm going to go down to the bottom of the layers panel and click the FX icon. Pierre, what does FX stand for? Special effects. Like effects? But FX like starts with an E. Like SFX, yes. Yeah. SFX, like special effects. It would be SFX. FX yep. is uh, like in movies and film and stuff. That's right. I we guess see that's that all it. the time. FX. So the effect that I'm going to choose is the bevel and emboss effect, and that opens the great big layer style dialog box, which I have to move out of the way so you can see the image over here. Maybe I can. No, I can't. All right, so um, I then I'm just going to choose some different options for my uh, bevel. There are many you could choose from, like you could get a hard style rather than a soft style, and that changed this edge over here. You could increase the depth to see it better. One thing I like to do is come down to an area of the layer styles that a lot of people don't go to, and that's the, um, the contours. If you click this arrow to the right of contours, you've got all this built-in stuff ready to go. So if I click on these different little dialogues or little thumbnails, look how the frame is changing. And I can just click through and, you know, somebody else has done all the work there for me. And that's just kind of um, combinations of different options for this layer style. So I'll go with that. I'll click OK. And now you can see my new layer style hanging off of the frame, wow. of, of the frame layer. See it down there? That's very cool. I just cool. want to mention oh. the past 10 minutes now, so. Oh, no. All right, one more thing and then I'm going to stop. Let's say... Uh, um, that I want to, um, 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 okay, well, actually two more things and then I will. Um, I, <laughs> I want to have a little bit of more dimensionality inside of the frame. And to do that, I'm going to go to a different layer. And you might find this surprising, but I'm going to go to the matte layer and I'm going to add a layer style on that one that's an inner shadow. And then we'll be able to see that inside of the frame. You wouldn't see an inner shadow if I added it to the frame because the frame layer has no transparency. It's just all filled with black whereas the matte layer has that little bit of transparent pixels around it. So again, I'll go down to effects. This time I'm going to choose my inner shadow effect. Um, you know, I can do things to it, like maybe increase the size or lower the opacity and say OK. And now you see how the frame appears to pop out a little bit? Mm -hmm. And if I want to have a similar dimensionality on the photo layer, then I'm going to click on that inner shadow that's hanging off the matte layer Hold the Option key, that's the important part, and it's the Alt key on the PC, and drag that inner shadow up to the photo layer to copy it. So that's a quick way to copy a layer style from one layer to another. And look at now how the photo itself seems to be pushed back inside of the mat. That is really cool. So here, if I turn that off, you can see the difference on and off, and on and off with this one. Oh, and like there's completely... more, but that's all we're going to do. Nice. Yay. Love it. Yay. Thank you, Jane. Crowd goes wild. <laughs> but it's really fun. You know, I know we always think of Photoshop as just a photo editing program, but it really is so much more. It's amazing what you can do with kind of graphic effects. Um, so ex I urge you to explore those. And with that, I'm going to unshare my screen and turn the floor over to our special guest, Mr. Pierre Etienne Courtejois. <laughs> Quite a mouthful, huh? It is. Yes. Uh, I can't figure out how to unshare my screen. Hang on, sorry. Give me a second with that. Here we go. Just click the screen share. Click screen share once more. I can't even find screen share. Oh, <laughs> probably on I'm back window. on the. Oh dear. Do you have a second window hanging out behind there? No, maybe. Yes, I do. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. So, 
Here we go. <laughs> we see your screen now, Pierre. Okay, perfect. So I will start uh, my little um, presentation of today by talking about troubleshooting Photoshop. We all know that Photoshop is a very stable application, but with the time, um, it has also supported uh, graphic video card acceleration, and that is, uh, makes it detrimental to the quality of the drivers. We'll talk about that, the video card drivers. We'll talk about that later without going into the technical details, don't worry. Um, but uh, also, sometimes we are testing stuff in Photoshop. That's the best way to learn. I do recommend to dive in Photoshop and learn, experiment stuff. What's this tool you don't know about? Click on the tool. Look its name. When you click on the tool, it will should give you a tool tip. I don't know if you can see it here. It might be a little bit small. It's the brush tool that we all know it. But for instance, we've got here the background eraser tool. It's a very powerful tool. So if you don't know about a tool, just hover it, look its name, Google it. Yes, Google it. Search for <laughs> uh, tutorials about uh, that tool. And I would recommend also to go uh, to Photoshop Help. So you go to the Help menu, and you type in uh, that, that string of letters, and you read, educate yourself. But while doing that, we might trigger some settings and make Photoshop misbehave. Ooh, what are we going to do? So I will start with uh, giving you some common issues that I've seen during the years of being moderator in many places or just being addicted to many online communities, including the Google Plus, uh, Photoshop, and Lightroom community. And uh, I will um, then show you the, the, the common errors, then show you how to fix those errors quickly. That's good, because I could just show you the, what is the problem and run away. <laughs> but uh, I will so then look into uh, when you cannot see what is the issue, how to try to fix a tool. Then the Dreadit resets the preferences. I, it's, it's a look daunting, it looks really difficult, but it's way easier than resetting, than uh, reinstalling Photoshop and fixes way more problems than reinstalling Photoshop. Then I will let you, uh, give you some resources also to, excuse me? No. No, okay. Uh, then I will give you some resources about where to find help in case you're stuck. Uh, because, yes, sorry, Jan, there are other places than the Google uh, community, but uh, just ask there, because there is really a, a huge amount of knowledgeable folks over there that can help you in a second. Uh, I, I've, I've seen many uh, thank yous being exchanged and many questions and thank you, be, thank you being exchanged over there. Um, I'll talk after that about also how to keep Photoshop working for you to prevent problems. Uh, I'd say Photoshop hygiene. So I think that's quite a lot to cover, I hope, and that would be enough for today. So I will start then with the, uh, the tools that misbehave. You might uh, want to paint. This is a uh, waterfalls from Iceland, if I remember correctly. Yes, so you want to paint uh, and uh, add some of the blue color over there. And so what are you doing? You're getting the brush tool, and you know that um, you can use keyboard shortcuts to help you work faster in Photoshop. Uh, Jan said it clearly, keyboard shortcut, as it can be really addictive. I will make a small uh, aparté, as we say in French. Sorry, pardon my French, and that's why my accent is so strange. It's a mix of American accent and French accent, so it maybe it looks like Canadian accent, I've been told. There are some little rules to remember with keyboard shortcuts. Uh, if you remember simple stuff, like when you are in the uh, Explorer or in the Finder, to select one file, you click on it. To select several files, you shift-click. So shift usually is add. Shift will add several uh, elements uh, when you select them. It will add several layers when you select them. Alt on the opposite, or option on a Mac, I think we all know that right now, is 
the opposite, is the alternate setting, is an option. So you're, you're selecting another option. For instance, if you're using the dodge tool, I cannot because I don't have any layer selected, so that's one thing. You learn, you need to have a layer selected. You know if what, you, I, have to t I think that's the main thing that we all do. We forget to select the layer. All the experts, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> So uh, if you use the, the uh, dodge tool, if you use the alt key, it switches to the, it should switch, to the uh, burn tool. It has the opposite uh, setting. You see here, it darkens the image rather than lightening it. So I will change the setting. So this is lighting the image. I am with the dodge tool. If I hold on the Option key or the Alt key, I'm darkening. So Alt is the opposite. So that's a good tip to remember. It can help you in many cases. Uh, making selection, Shift you add to a selection, Alt you remove from a selection. Also, one stuff that I want to say that can help you a lot is right-click does wonders. Right-click on a PC is usually called the contextual menu on a Mac. And contextual, it means that it gives you information related to the context you're doing, to what you're doing right now. So here I've got a selection. I can deselect. So that was the little aparté, the little uh, off cursus I wanted to say about the about the shortcuts. So it's it's really good and it empowers you and you you will work way faster in Photoshop if you know your shortcuts. So but no I am trying to paint was I saying bef before I rudely interrupted myself. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to uh, sample a color over there. So what I do instead of painting, that's why I came into that, if I want to paint, I lay, some, lay down some colors. I undo. But if I want to sample a color, I use the Option key, and it turns you into the uh, Color Sampler tool. And I can sample, sample a color. And you can see here the new uh, uh, color ring that lets you see exactly the color that you are sampling, which is really useful if you're running CS6 on a machine that has a graphic card acceleration. But if you look closely at my toolbar, you can see that I sampled color with, uh, for the background well. And that's not what I wanted to do. I did not alt-click with the color sampler tool. Where is the, up over there, that's the sampler. But I, I did not want it to select the background. What happened? In fact, in Photoshop, you need to look at every palette all the time. <laughs> in this case, that's a very common issue you see often on the forums. If you try to sample colors and you're sampling for the background well, instead of the foreground color, look into the, your color palette color panel now, they're called panels since a few versions, but our diehard old school guys still call them palettes. And you can see that I've got the, the set background color box selected. So that's an easy fix. You just click on the foreground, and now whenever I will sample the color up, I'm sampling. OK, of course, that's the live up. Uh, the yes, because I'm when I alt click with the brush tool, that's what I think. I am sampling colors for the foreground. That's what I wanted to do. So it's it's quite easy to miss because it's very subtle here in the uh, the new interface. There is just a very thin highlight around the foreground web. But that's the first thing often that often happens. But what I might have another issue I can hear all the time in the forums is uh, where is my brush tool? I cannot see my my uh, my brush uh, cursor. Tip. Cursor. Thank you. Sorry. Three o'clock in the morning. It's kicking in. Um, so what to do? It's easy. You've got your caps lock key. Select. Uh, hold. Press down. And now if I press my caps lock, that's the key on top of the left side uh, shift key. You can see the radius of your cursor. And uh, now if you use the square brackets, you can change the size dynamically. Yeah. So it's a quick uh, error I see often. And something that you might do while trying to hit that caps lock key is hit the 
tab key. And what does it do? Where are my tools? Where, where, what am I going to do? So the tab key is really useful because it lets you hide the, the tools. But uh, when you don't know about it, it's quite a troublesome. So if your tool disappears, just press the tab key. So those are really simple for us uh, long-time users. But if you're a Photoshop beginner, that might help you. No, a tool might not work how you want it to work. I'll try to find, I've got some image open here. Yes, voila. So this image was shown. No, it's not in Las Vegas. It's in Moscow. Um, you, you might have a tool that does not behave the way you want because you change the settings somewhere in the brush panel, for instance, and you change the shape dynamics, whatever you, you change. And uh, it, it makes the tool paint in a way that doesn't, you don't want to, uh, uh, sorry, start again. So the tool does not behave the way you, you, it's supposed to. There is a very easy fix for that. You just go on top to your option bar. And that's where you set the options of your tools. And you see here, that's the, the current tools uh, that are uh, selected. It gives you different presets. That's very useful because uh, they also store the color you, you are using. So it stores all the settings of the brush panel for the brush tool, plus all the settings you've got here in your toolbar. And here, for instance, yes, I'm trying to paint. And if I wanted to paint, I noticed that hey, it is doing something really funky. The fix is really simple. I am on luminosity blending mode. but it might be another setting that you're not seeing. In this case, just right click over the, your current tool in the option bar and you've got a reset, reset tool. And this will bring the tool to its default settings. So that's the way it's supposed to work right out of the box. And this way I've got here the, the cursor. I can see that I can change its size. And now when I paint with my, uh, is it? Teal, I don't remember which the name of the color, that's not teal. With you know my, what, you uh, know what, Pierre? Um, mm -hmm. Excuse me for interrupting. I was going to say, I think that's really important. And I every time I show people, they're surprised. They've never seen that. Yes. But I would say I do that almost every time I sit down to do a new photo, to work on another photo. I reset all my tools, not just yes. a single tool. Yes, that's, a one. that's the next step indeed. Uh, as I show you, there is also reset all tools and it's usually, usually useful in the classroom environment because uh, you don't know what's been done in the previous class. So reset all tools, it will set everything back to the default. Okay. Well, the tools options back to the default. I'm sure that's why it was invented because <laughs> somebody was teaching in a classroom and tried to <laughs> use the, pro the computers after. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and then uh, we've got the preferences. The preferences, it might be daunting as well because there is a lot of options. On a Macintosh, it's in the Photoshop menu, while on a PC, it will be at the bottom of the Edit menu. It's Control k or Command k I don't know why, maybe because that letter was free. And in there, we can see, for instance, we can change the color of the interface. Let's do this for a moment. Uh, but um, this has got plenty of settings. You can change the language if you install Photoshop with uh, Creative Cloud and you install it in several languages. That's a big advantage of Creative Cloud. Um, you can change the font size because there is a way to make it uh, larger, but you, it needs a reboot in order to change. So uh, that's a question I've seen, I think, on the uh, Photoshop and Lightroom group over there. But sometimes the Photoshop uh, preferences, they're supposed to be saved when you quit Photoshop. But Photoshop might crash. I hope that Chris Cox and the other Photoshop engineers are not listening to me. Photoshop, no, does, does crash really, does not crash often. More often when it crashes is because of a plugin or third party um, support that's crashing Photoshop. Uh, I've seen a graphic, uh, graphic tablet uh, drivers, uh, usually non-Wacom ones, and I'm not paid by Wacom, but uh, I, I use my Wacom tablet, never had any issue, and when I read online all the problems that users of all the brands of tablets have, it, quite, it can be interesting. So uh, what you need to, 
to look first is when something started to misbehave. If it's when you added a new font, for instance. So that's a good uh, hint that you should maybe look into your uh, font menu and uh, divide it by two, remove half of the fonts, and start troubleshooting that way. But we'll come to that later. But what might happen is Photoshop crashed at one moment, but it did not have the time to save properly its preferences. And the preferences can be all kind of settings because it can be the size of the uh, of the uh, thumbnails in the uh, layers menu. So uh, it. It, there are countless of settings, so it's a, it's a fragile file, a file that's easily broken. So in case Photoshop really does not work, even when you uh, reset your tool, you just quit Photoshop and restart it holding the Control, Alt, and Shift key on a PC, and Shift, Command, and uh, Option key on a Mac. And you should receive a prompt asking you, do you really want to delete your prof Photoshop preferences? Often you will see online people will say, oh, I tried to reset, to reinstall Photoshop, and it still does not work. It's really simple, because when you uninstall or reinstall Photoshop, it does not touch the preference file. So that way, if in case your preferences are correct, and you, you change the settings the way you want, the, the color of the interface, the size of your thumbnails, etc. Uh, it, it will keep those settings intact. Uh, there is also a way to go hunt for that Photoshop preference file, and the easiest is just to uh, search for, search for instance in the, your uh, sorry, in uh, the uh, search menu and CS6. Of course, it's the live, uh, it's, it's the live show uh, syndrome. I cannot remember the name right now, but you can just Google it online. <laughs> you can search the, the location of the uh, Photoshop uh, preference settings, and usually it's in your user setting. So you have got users, I've got Peck, because that's my nickname, Pierre-Etienne Courtejoie. And um, mm -hmm, on a Mac, because I, I more often troubleshooting on a PC. No, that's not preference. Applications, it's directly here. Sorry. I'm lost. What, uh, I let me ask you, while, as you're looking, are you trying to delete the preferences file? Is that what you're... Yes, yes. So if, because some users have a hard time, they might have an SSD that's making their machine really fast and they don't have the time to hit quickly the shift out uh, command keys and uh, it cannot, uh, it's not fast enough to uh, um, delete those, uh, those settings. Okay. Right, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that on the PC. What he's talking about, I think, is when you restart the program on the Mac, you could hold uh, Command Option Shift as you restart, and on the PC, Control Alt Shift, and that's supposed to give you a little message that says, "Do you want to?" Uh, yeah. Something it doesn't say throw away, but do you want to reset your preferences? Reset your preferences. Yeah. Okay, no. Uh, I think I won't lose some time here uh, searching your time searching for it. I will. What I will do is just simply once the show will be posted, I will post the the path to do to, to those files in the into the uh, the hangout and uh, the uh, as a comment on YouTube. But uh, simply, what you need to know, it's a file that you can uh, craft yourself. You can create uh, your preference and uh, adjust Photoshop the way you want. You can change the interface as you want. So what you may want to do, once you've got everything set up, is go hunt for that file. So link later. It's a link bait. And uh, you will uh, be able to save that file. So that's why some users say replace your preference file because you can keep a copy of that, of that preference file and just drag it to the, the folder because it's a user folder because you can have several users having each one their preferences and replace that preference file easily. Now, uh, also when I mentioned earlier that you need to look in Photoshop what, what you are doing. Uh, for instance, um, here I'm trying to paint 
I will switch the default color, D from key, X to exchange the colors, and I want to paint on this layer, and nothing happens. So rather than go uh, try to simply reset the, reset the tool all the time, it's best to educate yourself and try to find why it does not work. So uh, a painting tool has different blending modes, and but in this case it is normal. Prior I had it set to luminosity, and it did not paint the way I was thinking it would paint. It can have uh, also a different opacity, but your layer can also have a different blending mode. Maybe you created a layer uh, for a certain purpose, and you're trying now to paint in a layer that's set to darken mode. You know. Unfortunately, the layers do not say their blending mode here right next to their name. It's me, I, I did it to, as, a mem as a mnemonic for me. What else can happen? You can uh, want to paint, and then, what am I doing? I'm painting and I'm seeing the background show through. I might have made a special uh, setting, might have made a special change on the layer. And in older version, that was really a big puzzle. You really wonder what happened, what's, what's going on. In fact, here it's just the blend if. It allows you to blend the image with the underlying layer. There are really cool tutorials about that. It's really a powerful tool because it lets you paint, uh, it lets you merge different images in a gradual way. You can even split to make a gradual change. I don't know if you can see that because it, it can change the, you can see when, as I increase this, it can help you show an image through. But what I did, I had this set to a non-default settings. But you can look that now, thanks to uh, Katrin Iceman, she's the one that's been lobbying for years. I've seen it on the, the feedback website. We've got now this strange icon over there that tells you, and if I hover it, indicates layer as advanced blending options. So if you see something funky happen on the layer, the, the well, the blending mode is normal, the opacity is normal, the fill is normal, but you see this little icon, it, it brings you directly here to the, the layer style, to the blending options. So uh, it's right next on top of the uh, bevel emboss that Jan showed earlier. So you just click here on the blending options and you can switch it back or bring it back to default if it's, and if it's gray. Uh, it's, it's also a shortcut to change the fill opacity if I accept it, yes, it's there. So, But this little icon over there tells you everything. It's really useful. You know, I have to tell you this, Pierre. Today when I was preparing that tutorial, that happened to me. I saw that icon. I knew mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it before, but the truth is I didn't know what the heck it did. And I clicked on it, and then that box opened. I'm like, well, now what? So you have solved a mystery for me. <laughs> you have answered a question I didn't even know I had. That's yes, great. There is Yes, there is a lot of information in the, the layers panel. And, and uh, whenever you click somewhere, it can do uh, bring a different menu. You can show high layers over there. There is, there is a lot to learn right in the layers panel, because here I just right click one location. It's the uh, blending options. I right click here uh, next to the name. It's the, the, uh, I get another menu. I right click on the um, the image thumbnail, it's yet another option. And, and it's everywhere you click on the interface, you can have different settings. So I know Photoshop, we, during the years, has evolved a lot. So users have been asking for new features. Adobe has been putting the best feature, the one that they were deemed the best, or the one they, they, are, they understood the user wants. Because like, for instance, in the past, people wanted to have different uh, undo, because before there was just this, one undo, control Z, that was it. And uh, Jeff Shuey and others uh, were asking for a way to have different uh, undo steps. And instead, uh, the, the uh, Photoshop architect of the time, Mark Hamburg, uh, designed the history panel, which is really powerful, because you can go back in time and do a lot of stuff. So that. I'm diving way too much into other details. But so there are little stuff we've seen so far. So reset the tool with a right click on the, uh, the tool icon on the option bar. Look at your Photoshop interface, because most more often than not, the setting that changed something 
it's it's right in front of your eyes but there is a lot of places where you need to look at you've got the option bar if you're using a brush tool you might want to look into the brush settings there is the layers panel now we've got also the very useful properties panel that will uh, give you uh, different options in CS6 and I, I hope that in the future they will invest a lot of, of attention to that panel. And one hint, uh, one little trick I could say is since it pops up quite often, rearrange it and put it, for instance, here with the adjustments so that it will not jump at you each time you, you click on a, on a setting. So uh, you can change. Yeah, that's actually, I was thinking I really don't like the properties panel because of the fact that it pops out and often covers up part of my photo. Yeah, what I, what I do recommend indeed is to move that properties because it's really a useful one. It will be used, I think, more and more with the time. Just move it as, as a panel, as a, a sticky panel rather than a fly, fly out one and save it as a new uh, workspace so that that way you can go back to that and it will never annoy you any, anymore. Good suggestion. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to tell you that it's um, we've been uh, here for... We have about 10 an minutes hour. left, right, Ron? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've been here for about an hour, but we started a few minutes late, so we're good for, for just a bit. OK, so quickly, I will go quickly uh, and uh, go over um, some stuff. Also, now I'd like to, to see the part, how to keep Photoshop working right for you. The first rule is update Photoshop. And I'm really sad because in preparation for this, uh, Hangout here. I did not update Photoshop to the latest version. Now we should be running 13.0.4, and I'm still running 13.0.3. Uh, but usually Adobe uh, has made a, a really good um, updater. I saw it in Jan's presentation earlier. She has a lot of updates to push to her machine. But that that's arrived uh, quite, quite often on a on a presentation machine because it's it's our, our uh, laptop that goes to the field and uh, we don't always have time to push the updates or we re-image the machine and don't have time to push the updates. But usually you will see an Adobe logo icon over there in uh, on the top part of the. Uh, uh, sorry, it's quite it's four o'clock in the morning now for me. Uh, I don't remember the name here uh, in the, the, the... The bar at the top. <laughs> yeah, the bar at the top on the Mac. Oh, sorry, it's appalling. Um, so you will see an Adobe icon over there, and I think on a Windows it will be into the, the lower uh, right corner where all the uh, information is stored at. And uh, if you click in there, it will launch the Adobe Updater. And here you can go, if you don't see that, know that I told you there is a new update, you can go to Help Update, and it will launch the Adobe Updater, uh, the Adobe uh, Application Manager, and it will let you know if there is an update available. So keep it up to date, because uh, the, the uh, Photoshop engineers are really busy fixing every other bug that are reported. They're trying to always improve the experience. Photoshop is huge. It's a huge application, it does 3D, it does video, it does, uh, it does everything for you but the coffee. But uh, also uh, they change a lot of settings here, they change the whole interface here for CS6. So it's normal that there might be a bug or the other that slips through the cracks. And even sometimes they're fixing bugs in others' programs. Uh, if there might be a bug in the... Uh, Apple's handling of the cursor and they will try to find a workaround and work really hard. So keep Photoshop up to date. So run the updates over there and make sure that you're running the latest version here, the 13.0.4. It fixes the issue where you see Photoshop is going into trial mode. I see, I've seen plenty of users have that issue. Uh, the the um, Activation is, uh, there is always a huge debate on the internet. Usually the people that did not pay for Photoshop are totally against it. And, uh, but the issue is that sometimes you can run into the, you can run into problems if, when you're using it legally. So do update Photoshop. I talked earlier about the fact that Photoshop now can, um, 
use your graphic card to do some uh, magic. Here it's using my graphic card to, to uh, rotate the screen. So that means that it needs to have uh, the graphic card drivers up to date. On a Windows, you need to find what graphic card you are using. Usually it's either an ATI, I know it's been bought by AMD or an NVIDIA. It might be an Intel if you're using an Intel motherboard. And go see uh, their drivers section of their website to see if you, they don't have an updated version because usually they also fix uh, bugs here and there. And uh, so running with the latest version, it's really good because uh, it, it can fix or break your Photoshop if you're not. Um, also, Photoshop is a, a program that uses a lot of memory. Right now, memory is cheap. Uh, even if you've got an Apple uh, laptop, you can push, uh, put up to 8 or 16 gigs of RAM, besides if you do have the very brand new Retina ones. But uh, even Apple gives a guide how to update your memory yourself. It's really simple. You just uh, follow the steps on the Apple website. On a PC, if it's a, a laptop, you unscrew the parts and the, 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 in the back, you search for the kind of memory you've got. But stuff your uh, computer to the max. Give it as much RAM as it can. And run a, Photoshop will run really smoothly. On this machine, I did update the, change the hard drive for an SSD, so it's like a hard drive based on memory, and that makes really Photoshop fly. Uh, because Photoshop uses a lot of the hard drive as a scratch file, it's the, the temporary file it, where it puts all the settings, while it keeps uh, the, the memory as a cache. So it, it puts everything in the memory for faster action, but the real memory of Photoshop is a scratch file. What you want to do is make sure, in your preference, performance, that you allocate enough RAM for Photoshop. If Photoshop is starting on RAM, starving on RAM, it will not work properly. But you need also to give some uh, memory for the rest of Photoshop. If you're giving all the memory to Photoshop, like uh, here I could give uh, 7 gigs of RAM to Photoshop, but I want to process some images in uh, Bridge. Bridge is very powerful. Learn Bridge. Bridge is good for you. Uh, because you can process several photos, you can launch, launch filters on several photos in Bridge, but if you allocate all the memory to Photoshop, Bridge will be starving on RAM, it will be run slow, and uh, so try to find a correct balance between uh, more memory and all the memory. A scratch disk as well, if you've got a, a tower or a desktop computer, try to find the fastest disk you've got, and uh, select it as your active drive and drag it to the top because it will use the, the drives in, in the order they're indicated over there. Um, in here, if Photoshop misbehaves because of driver settings, there might be an issue in my graphic card that's not been set by Apple because I forgot to mention if you're running on a Mac, the uh, graphic card updates are offered, quote, quote, by the uh, OS updates by the updates of your machine, of your Mac. So each time you update uh, Mac OS, it might get a new driver update, and that might fix an issue you're running. But sometimes, uh, if you're running a new version of Photoshop, this is not true anymore now, but if it was Photoshop 13.00, uh, sometimes some user had some graphic card issues because Photoshop uh, engineers cannot test every single graphic card out there. And the, the fix for that was to disable uh, the graphic processor. So you were losing some of the graphic card acceleration, but at least Photoshop was working while they were working with NVIDIA and uh, ATI or AMD to find a fix. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. while yes. you're, well, before you get out of this window, because mm -hmm. I think it has to do with some of these settings. I'm not sure. Yes. But um, Bridge mm -hmm. uh, tends to... And apparently it does for a lot of people, but I bet it's I bet it's something simple. It tends to bog down and um, require you to purge your cache every time you open it. Yes. And do those uh, kinds of things. Yes, the, the bridge cache has changed from version to version, so it's good when you install here the new CS6 version to start from scratch with the cache. I know it's not happy, it's not something that we want to hear, but really it's a new um, database. It's running a new database engine, even though we always say that Lightroom is the database-based uh, program, 
Bridge also has a database because it needs to cache all the thumbnails. So it's it's a database for that. So can uh, you explain Bridge, the tall and thin versus flat? Yes. And, okay. Uh, and maybe that's getting too detailed. Yeah, we, we might we might run out of the. Uh, but basically, if you're designing uh, working on a panorama on a big photo, select big and flat. What it will do, it will have more cache levels. The cache levels are the numbers of zoom levels Photoshop keeps into memory. When you, you zoom in, it will go faster. That's really uh, uh, a simple way to explain it. While the tall and thin, I would recommend this one for web designers that will be working with hundreds of, docu of layers, usually maybe on the 800 by 600 if they're designing for the a small uh, phone or uh, no, maybe uh, the resolution are going higher and higher on the, the phones. The phone resolution is higher than the desktop resolution. But tall and thin, usually that will uh, keep less cache levels and uh, it does it change the cache tile size? No, it does not. But basically, it all depends on what kind of documents you work with. Photographers, I would recommend to work with big and flat. Uh, that way, it will it will speed up the, the zooming when you, you're uh, going in and out your document, while the tall and thin is fully optimized for the, as I call the tall document, that is, uh, it has a lot of layers, tall in the layers panel. I have a question for you, um, and it's, it just reminded me when you mentioned the phone. Um, we heard that Photoshop has now been optimized for the Apple, what's it called, the high resolution, the, uh, the retina. The retina display. Can you explain what the heck that does regarding file size? Nothing. Nothing. Because you Nothing. know how I heard retina display was something like two times or two times the number of pixels yes. packed into what, one? What it will mean is that the graphic card will need to feed two times the number of pixels to the screen because the screen has two times the size of pixels. And even sometimes it will scale them down afterwards because uh, if you're using one of the non-standard resolutions, it will uh, uh, launch way more pixels and then scale them down for a crisp appearance. And on the, the Retina uh, Photoshop version, so that is 13.0.2, I think, uh, now the whole interface is way more crisper because they, they made all the, the change again all the cursors for this new resolution. I'm not running a retina here. But um, uh, so it will not change your file size for your documents. That said, if you want to have a background image uh, for your uh, backdrop, for your uh, desktop, you will need twice a large an image. And if you uh, create websites, uh, image for websites optimized for the retina users, some recommend to, to feed uh, a progressive JPEG, uh, so that way it can feed the large resolution and lower resolution. But for that, I would recommend to look really online. There are some blogs dedicated to uh, user interface. I think Django, B-J-A-N-G-O. Um, it's one of them. It's it's uh, it's another Photoshop tester that's really really uh, into foot into uh, interface design, and he knows his stuff about uh, about Retina ins and outs. Very um, helpful. But it, but just to be clear, Pierre, if I have a regular you know three hundred by four hundred pixel file and I want it to be half as big, I just do as I always did in the image size dialog box. Correct. Nothing new. Nothing new for. For what purpose exactly? To to show it to somebody that has a retina, or uh... yes, yes. Uh, let's let's say that purpose. Well, if uh, he he can show a larger image on screen than somebody else would. So if you were uh, cropping your images, you send by email to uh, 1600 by 1200 or something like that. You might want to know send larger images so that they can see the image in their full glory, of course, after you added your copyright. So but, that image uh, will look smaller on a retina display than it will look on a regular non-retina display, is what you're saying? Yes, or it, if they zoom in the image so that it feels the same amount of on screen, it might look blockier. Ah, I see. Okay, got it. Thank you.
but it's the same image. They will see the same image and they just zoom in. If they zoom in so that they see uh, 1200 pixels, they will see the same 1200 pixels you were seeing. It might be smaller on the screen or they might be seeing more of the image on their screen. And another question you were starting to explain about purging the cache in Bridge. Yes. Show okay. Where? Yes. Then no, I'm switching to Bridge. Voila. In Bridge, uh, you've got the tools cache. You can purge cache for a given folder. So, for instance, and do update Bridge. There is a Bridge update that's been pushed this week, where there was an issue where Bridge was constantly refreshing uh, its uh, TIFF. Uh, the, 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 it was constantly recreating the thumbnails for the TIFF files, and they finally found a fix. And so, right this week, there, if you're running uh, CS6, there is Bridge 5, because it's one version after, uh, 0 .0, 0 0.0.2 that fixes that issue. So keep Photoshop Bridge Lightroom up to date. Look for that little uh, Adobe icon that I hope that would pop up there so that I could show it to you, but keep it up to date. Uh, also, something, some, a lot of people are complaining that Bridge is slow. You've got different settings you can change here. Here, but it's not self-explanatory. The icon is not uh, self-explanatory. So uh, right next to the star rating filter, you've got here browse quickly by preferring embedded images. That means it will use whatever um, thumbnail is inside the image. If you just shot your images on a, with raw files, uh, and an F file or CRW2 uh, if you're running a, a Canon, uh, it can use the embedded thumbnail. That's the JPEG that's inside the raw file. It, it can use that to show your image quickly. So that way you can sort your image, and if something is fuzzy, you can already trash it. Well, if you select the thumbnail quality, it will use Camera Raw for the raw files. And even it could also use Camera Raw for the JPEGs and uh, Photoshop uh, files if you select it into the preferences. So, Wait, that, that's, so which one makes it faster than you had yours always high quality checked, right? I don't know. Uh, I just, I don't know which one I had. Uh, it's, it all depends what I'm doing in Bridge mm. because if I'm uh, in, importing a lot of images and I want to I'm in a hurry before a Google Plus Hangout and I haven't selected my images. <laughs> and those are raw files. I would switch to the, uh, to the uh, browse quickly. But the, the high quality, that's what you want. Ultimately, what you want to do once you, you, you deleted the, the ones where somebody is clearing the frame, it's not something that the magical Photoshop tools can fix. Uh, switch to the high quality and generate 100 person previews because then when you'll be looking at the previews of the images in Bridge, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the zoom will, will load almost instantly. So a good thing, review your images with the uh, embedded images and then switch to quality. If, you, if you've got a lot of images, you can let it crank overnight point to the, the back of the, uh, the, the root of your images and build an explode, export cache and all folders. So you can go to the root and let it work overnight. That's a good settings uh, that will let a bridge recreate all the thumbnails for you. And what if you purge the cache? Do you lose your keywords or other metadata that you've added? No, normally the cache is only the, uh, uh, the thumbnails. The metadata is supposed to stick. Normally, they are inside the files in case of JPEGs. Uh, the metadata would be outside of the file in case, in case of uh, raw files that are NEF files. Uh, the DNG files, which are the holy grail of, uh, of uh, raw files, it's a, it's a raw file that's been created by Thomas Knoll. So, which is the original creator of Photoshop, the guy that's also behind Lightroom, beside, behind Camera Raw, be, behind everything that's cool inside Photoshop. He had created a raw file format that lets you put all the data inside a single file, including the metadata. It has pros and cons. But its real goal is not normally to convert all your files. 
your raw files into that. You can do that, but its real goal what would be for a camera manufacturer to adopt it. What does it mean if they adopt uh, the DNG file format? Is that the day you purchase a new camera, it will be supported in Camera Raw. Usually when there is a new, brand new camera out and uh, you see people start complaining on the forums, oh, I cannot open it. First, they need to check if Photoshop is up to date and Camera Raw is up to date. That way, uh, because when updating to Camera Raw, you can update your camera to a new uh, Camera Raw to new um, profiles for the new images, the new camera. And uh, also, if you're running an older version of Photoshop, which would be very sad, uh, you can use the DNG converter in that case to convert the images to DNG and the DNG being uh, uh, an international format, uh, uh, really a um, transmission format, it can be open a version up to uh, for Camera Raw 2.4, which means uh, Photoshop CS1. So uh, I see often people say, uh, be upset that they cannot update, open the, the new the files from the new camera in their old version of Photoshop, no, they can. Photoshop created is the only manufacturer that created a piece of software. It's the DNG converter that lets you convert your proprietary raw files. Proprietary does mean it has secret sauce in there. The manufacturer don't want to tell what they've got in there, even though their files are really close to a DNG file. Uh, you can convert them into a format that, will, uh, that can be open even in other software. If you're running Aperture because you might not like uh, Lightroom, I don't know how that could happen. <laughs> no, but that, that happens uh, because you, you might be editing your photo in iPhoto and you've got a huge library of photo already edited and you want to continue with that with uh, Aperture. It's your choice. But you can even use DNG files in there and uh, even unsupported uh, files. If uh, Apple supports the, total, the totality of the DNG specification, that, what does it mean? It, they, they've got different versions of DNG. If they support the latest one, they can, they can uh, import a photo that's not known, a format that's not known in a program, and it should be open in that program. You know, I agree with you. It's very important to um, update your camera raw. Another reason that people don't always know is if you're going to use Lightroom and Photoshop together on raw files, you want to have the very latest or matching versions mm -hmm. of camera raw and Lightroom, and they are matching. So if you have, uh, you know, Lightroom uh, 4.3 matching camera raw 7.3, for example, yeah. would be that. And I want to go back and ask you this because I really need to understand this. What is the difference in bridge between build and export cache and purge cache for for Boulder or whatever? Okay, uh, hop. looks like an exam here. <laughs> yeah, no, I just want to know. <laughs> now, build and export cache. What it will do? It will uh, create the cache and save a cache normally inside the folders. If this is set here, you can have a cache file, I don't remember its file extension, directly in the folder. That means if you burn a whole folder with the cache, it should uh, be faster to be open in another computer. Uh, and here you can also select to build 100 person previews. That means that's, that's the one you use in the preview panel. Uh, purge cache, just purge the cache. If you, if you just purge the cache for this folder, it will just Purge the cache for this very folder, while build and export cache is used, as I said, in the root, in the, 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 the main folder that contains all your images. You click build and export cache overnight, uh, while on the 4 o'clock in the morning, for instance, and then you can, you can let it go and it will, it will create the cache for all the subfolders. So that's really maybe the, the first step you should do. Uh, while running bridge for the first time. It's let it know about your images so that it will be faster and opening them. It will know uh, also all information about uh, the images. It will know all its metadata. It, it will have read everything needed. Uh, I wanted, I don't know if I still have one minute or two. Um, we've gone pretty far over. Um, okay, yeah. So, uh, but then I will put all the links because those were the links of the page I would recommend to use if you're still stuck in Photoshop. So first look in the help files 
there is the feedback.community.photoshop.com. That's a place where you can ask a question where really you're stuck uh, in, in Photoshop. I do not recommend that or how to make a frame. I would go to Google Plus, uh, to the Google Plus community, ask over there, and uh, maybe Jan or somebody will point to this very recording here. This is more for, I would recommend to use this for more technical questions. Then we've got the Adobe forums. I will put the link later. And that's where a uh, lot of Adobe engineers hang out as well. Uh, as as uh, many user oh a face I know uh, <laughs> that's my <myself. laughs> there you are uh, uh, so that that's a place I would recommend to hang out there and then also the Google Plus community so what we'll do with those links if you uh, have them we can put them on the actual event page and then when I have the YouTube video ready in its final version. I'll add that right into the comment section. Yes, exactly. I, I will email you those links uh, maybe tomorrow morning for me. It will be, uh, might be during the night. I don't know <laughs> if you want everyth everything. I don't know when you're publishing the, the Hangout already after the show, immediately after the show. Sorry, what was that? Will you publish uh, it immediately after the show? It'll be viewable right after the show, but I... Wow, I high speed. I edit it a little bit and then I put it up tomorrow at the, the finished version. Okay, so then I will email you the all the links I recommend to uh, educate yourself and also to ask questions. Uh, so if you're you're stuck after uh, resetting the preference, reinstalling Photoshop, whatever, go there to ask for for help. And. You know, you have been so helpful. I can't thank you enough. Um, I want to recommend, you know, to our panelists and anybody out there listening, uh, that they uh, go that that you go to YouTube and you find where this particular show is and share it with your friends because mm -hmm. this is something that you can't find out anywhere else. I I really can attest to that. I've been doing this for years and I know all the little secret places. And Pierre has told me things that I don't know and that I don't know where to go look for. Oh, so I'm, this I'm already really cool. ready to watch this again a couple of times. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah. But I, I was I was thinking what would be nice to to do, and uh, I was thinking that yes, there there's never been a, a show about how to fix Photoshop or how to fix your usage of Photoshop so that you know how to work better and faster. You could probably like pull a big audience doing this every week. Yeah. Okay. Just on that, I think. Yeah, but uh, I'd select another schedule maybe so that I would be more <laughs> eloquent. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't stumble on every word and uh, be more prepared than here in the middle of the night. <laughs> well, maybe we'll do it sometime in the morning and then we'll, it'll still be on YouTube. That's the great thing about yeah. Hangouts. Yeah, no, no, exactly, yes. And uh, anyways, there are... Yeah. Excuse me? I say we can alter our schedules to do a recorded version, no trouble. Yeah, no problem. But uh, anyways, there is always somebody that's on the other side of the world. I, I sometimes, when I see some uh, uh, Adobe presentations, I sometimes see some Kiwis over there, some uh, people from New Zealand, and uh, I, it's affectionate, you know. It's not yeah, we've got we've got someone from Australia in the chat tonight. We've got someone from oh, China yeah. in the chat tonight. Howdy, hello. <laughs> <laughs> International day. <laughs> Yes. It's okay, been so I hope I was not too technical and not too fuzzy in my uh, flow of thought. And uh, if you've got any questions, so uh, I am hanging out anyways in the Google Plus community. I'm moderator on the Adobe forums. I'm at Spectra on the on uh, Twitter. It's like the uh, the evil guys in. Uh, Bond. James Bond, yes, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just because it has my initials and it's a spec. It's also the spectrum, like the color spectrum. Yeah. I found it uh, fitting. And is what, there still um, a Photoshop Techniques.com or is that over? Uh, yes and no. The, the website is still there, but she, we call her, we call her she. Uh, she suffered a lot during uh, merging with another forum because uh, she's been purchased by Mogo Media. It's uh, another great place to learn. Uh, about Photoshop, I know that uh, Linda makes, is making presentation. Uh, Jan is making presentation for Linda.com. I do for uh, Video to Brain, and there is Mogo Media. They do uh, some shows, in fact, in some places. There is a lot of places to learn. I, I think we all benefit from learning, and uh, remember that all those commercial sites often have also uh, free extracts. 
so it's useful to look for. And also I would recommend, I know I'm talking, to uh, go to tv.adobe.com and that's a huge a place where you see a lot of tutorials as well uh, yeah, to learn the programs. Yes, that is a great one. Well, it's been so wonderful to have you here. I want to talk to you some more. So sometime when it's during the day, um, let's talk because I'm interested in knowing more about the Photoshop and Lightroom communities in Europe, which is something we, we don't know very much about here in America. And I have a feeling they're huge um, and that you have resources there and things that you could tell us. You know, we should talk about that. Be yeah, interesting. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. The, the, that's what is cool about the internet. It's that's what I loved about the internet. Being myself an infoholic, I'm crazy about information and trying, trying always to learn and scavenge and look for information. But yes, the, there is so much knowledge out there, all over the place. And I wish I could talk many languages to to see uh, to learn some uh, tips in the Chinese forums uh, or, or whatever place there is. So it's always good. To, to be able to hang out with people all over the place, all over the world. So can I ask you a favor? Can you unshare your screen now so that we yes. can um, you know, see my goodbye. ugly face? My face. Uh, oh, <laughs> beautiful face. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see Karen. Click the screen share button once more. Yep, yep. There you are. Okay. <gasps> oh, yes, I should have put a parental warning advisory needed. Yes, oh. okay. So, uh, sorry, but it's it's too early for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's too early for you asleep. and it's late for me. Soon uh. you'll be asleep and you'll, it'll all be a memory. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'll right. be sleeping over this. Yes. Well, you go and get a nap, <laughs> and the yes. rest of us will um, go and relax after our long days. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, all you listeners out there. And we will see you in two weeks from now with another wonderful, amazing guest. And goodbye. Goodbye. Have a good night. We'll see Au revoir. You. Au revoir. <laughs>